On January 13th, Taiwanese voters elected current Vice President Lai, known as William Lai, to be their next president. Lai is a member of the ruling Democratic Progressive Party and is a supporter of Taiwanese sovereignty. He's been labeled a separatist by Beijing. Since Lai's election a couple of months ago, relations between Taiwan and China, which were already strained, have become more frosty. Beijing is ramping up pressure on the self-governed island, and suspicions that China will move to take control of Taiwan are growing. One crucial factor in Taiwanese sovereignty from China is energy independence. With the election of Lai, Taiwan is set to continue to shift away from nuclear power, putting the island at risk of an energy deficit. Ultimately, energy affairs could have sweeping effects on the calculus of cross-strait security. Today, we'll talk about all this and more. I'm David Satterfield, director of Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy in Houston, Texas, and this is Baker Briefing. Joining me today to discuss Taiwan's energy security challenges are Baker Institute experts Gabriel Collins, Steve Lewis, and Elsie Hong. Gabe and Elsie are both experts at the Center for Energy Studies, and Steve is the director of the Institute's China Studies program. Thank you all for being here today. Now, I'd like to begin with Taiwan's elections and their implications. Steve, what do those results say about political identity in Taiwan? So the 2024 elections in Taiwan actually say a lot about the political identity in Taiwan, how it's been changing. It's been changing according to like demographics and just maturity. It's also changing because of the specific outcome and some of the institution. So focus on demographics at first. Think about Taiwan as basically 40 years ago, they left martial law and they began to slowly introduce democratic reforms. And the late 90s, you get first native Taiwanese. They're moving away from one party rule. So what that means is basically two thirds of the population or so have actually no experience with martial law, no experience with KMT rule, no experience about this constant overwhelming threat from mainland China. And we can also see this very clearly in the identifications of Taiwanese. So 30 years ago, you asked Taiwanese people, do you see yourself as Taiwanese, Chinese, or both? Well, 30 years ago, Taiwanese basically said only a very small percentage said they saw themselves as only Taiwanese, but two thirds said they saw themselves as Taiwanese and Chinese. It's completely flipped. 60 some 70 percent of Taiwanese now see themselves as Taiwanese only. This probably reflects the fact that just younger people, you know, getting used to seeing themselves as basically the equivalent of an independent country. And this has also happened with the gradual democratization, adding in more proportional representation into the legislature, the different parties kind of competing over representing the various interests of groups, and also letting more indigenous people in Taiwan have more set seats, for example, in the legislature. So what you're beginning to see, for example, this most recent election, Taiwan had its first openly lesbian legislature elected. And this has a lot to do with politics and Taiwan of the competition between the parties. This particular election saw basically in the national legislature kind of a, a near balance between the two main parties, DPP and KMT, leaving the third party, the Taiwan People's Party, to try to pick up the remainder and potentially serve as kingmaker. So there is that kind of role going forward that you might get this competition for more local, more native identities actually increasing. Steve, a, a follow-on question. What was the election fought over? Was it a domestic Taiwanese direction issue? Was it on independence, relations with the mainland? What was the motivating factor? Great point. It was actually the economy. And very, very much we want to talk about what's affecting us in our day-to-day -day lives. It wasn't grand geostrategic geopolitical issues or the question of Beijing? Not at all. And in fact, it, all three of the main candidates for president, no real foreign policy experience. These are all people born and raised in Taiwan, rose up the ranks as local leaders dealing with local issues. Okay, very interesting. So what has been hailed as a vote for democracy, and I'll ask you to comment on whether in fact this really was a fair reflection of views of the electorate. How did the Chinese government 
How is the Chinese government responding? So the Chinese government, as expected, has been saying that this is increasing separatism, increasing influence from the United States and other bad actors. That said, you know, the response of Xi Jinping after the elections in Taiwan is largely using the same type of language he's used before. What's different, though, is that on the ground, they're being a lot more aggressive militarily with more flights, you know, kind of interfering in Taiwanese airspace and much more recently, a lot more ships and boats interfering in that. What's very likely going to happen, and Beijing already kind of warned of this during the elections, is that they will go back and revisit trade relations. Xi Jinping knows that about half of the foreign investment in Taiwan is from mainland China. He also knows that there's a lot of people in Taiwan who have businesses in China, businesses overseas, and that mainland China is Taiwan's largest trade partner. So it gives them a lot of leverage. And so probably what he's going to do is revisit, because they've already hinted that they're going to revisit looking at tariffs in particular as a way to try to bully economically Taiwan. Gabe, you've written quite a bit about the threat Taiwan faces. Can you describe the broad geostrategic picture for us right now? How serious, if not dire, is the situation today? And to caricature, exaggerate the way the threat is portrayed, are we facing a D-Day, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? Or are we looking at a progressive application of greater levers of pressure upon Taiwan. What should we be watching for and how should the U.S. respond? I think it's more of the latter, a full on invasion. If we look at Xi Jinping's demands and the objectives he's put forth for the Chinese military, we keep seeing the date 2027 come up as a target for having the capability to conduct something more like a full invasion of Taiwan. During the interim, we see the Chinese, the PRC continuing to work to build their capabilities in this regard. At this point, if you're rank ordering the threats, a blockade or something close to it is something that's probably a much more likely contingency. To, to sort of give some historical context to this, the issue is not new. We have a top secret memo in our, that we cited, and now declassified, of course, that we cited to open our recent foreign affairs piece that showed General Douglas MacArthur writing to President Truman in June of 1950, talking both about Taiwan's strategic importance and also the risk that was posed to it by communist forces from the, the PRC. And so the issue's not new. The intent has been there all along. What's really changed our PRC capabilities. If I were to use perhaps a you know semi-rough around the edges analogy, the PRC during much of the Mao Zedong period had the capabilities of a house cat and the desires of a tiger when it came to Taiwan. And so you had a mismatch between capability and intent. If you look, say, 30 years ago, roughly, when we had the Taiwan Strait crisis, when President Clinton was in office, you still had the mindset of a tiger on the PRC side and maybe the body of a bobcat. It was something where we could still bring carrier groups into the region and we could force them to back down. We're now approaching a point where you not only have the mindset and the hunting intent of a tiger, but you have a body that increasingly looks like a large tiger. And so this is a very serious state of affairs. When senior US commanders talk about the need to be ready to fight tonight and be able to respond rapidly and decisively to a Taiwan contingency, that's something but, that but is Gabe, accurate. But Gabe, I'll probe you further. For now, you say, this is a progression of pressures as opposed to a decisive single act that looks like a classic invasion. Do you see, once China realizes, assuming it does, the literal capacity for an invasion, will it choose that route or will it still opt for application of pressures of means of constraining Taiwan by other means? And a basic question for our listeners, what does Beijing want? What's the desired end state here? Is it a compliant uh, 
Taiwan that doesn't challenge Beijing's interests? Is it a Taiwan that is formally subservient, like Hong Kong, to Beijing, or something in between? This is a phenomenal question, particularly when we discuss this in the wake of how the PRC has subsumed Hong Kong. We've seen now the passage of two draconian national security laws. We see long prison sentences being assigned for what you would consider in most cases to be simple protest activity. And so if we had asked this question perhaps even 10 years ago, something like a Taiwan that was okay with the status quo that both allowed China to save face politically and also avoided disruptions to economic growth and other priorities was something that the leadership seemed to, even if it was tolerated somewhat grudgingly, there was also not a push to upset that apple cart. What's very concerning over the last few years, and Steve referenced the increasing tempo of uh, PRC military flights around the island, the near continual and significant PLA naval presence at this point, and other pressure measures that we're seeing capability, intent, and urgency start to come together in a way that we really haven't ever seen before. Before I move to Elsie, can I ask you a follow on to that? Many in the business community argue that the dependence, fundamental economic dependence of Beijing the regime on the industry and technology of Taiwan is so great that for the regime to act in a fashion which could harm or cripple that industry, that technology, the investment in Taiwan would be an act of self-harm to Beijing and a dissuading factor to some of the more draconian possibilities here. How do you assess it? Five to seven years ago, I would have agreed that it would be a dissuading factor. If we, at this point now, if we only look at the most cutting edge chips, things that are at node sizes of five nanometers, three nanometers and below, for instance, what you're going to see in some of the most advanced AI applications in your latest generation iPhones and so forth, that would be massively impacted, but so much of the semiconductors we consume are actually what they call legacy nodes. If you think about the disruptions we had during the pandemic, it actually wasn't on the cutting edge. It was the much older semiconductors that are so ubiquitous in the economy today. The challenge here is China's domestic capacity to produce significant quantities of these more legacy type semiconductors is now very substantial. And so one of the concerns that we have, and, and we've, we've been public with this in our writings, is when you think about a regime that is fundamentally animated by a zero-sum Marxist-Leninist mindset, you can start to see scenarios where they could plausibly conclude that in a land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, and in this case, they would have a good shot at being the one-eyed man given the semiconductor manufacturing capacity that they've built up domestically in the PRC. So if I were counting the importance of Taiwan semiconductors as a dissuading factor, that diminishes almost year on year on year based on what we see going on right now with the PRC's industry, semiconductor industry. Have banks and investors turned away from Beijing because of the draconian steps taken in Hong Kong? Or is that not a good example if you're at Taiwan examining what the consequences on the broader financial community are of these steps? I think it's not a good example. One, if you're looking at the Hong Kong situation, this is there's a moral dimension, which is probably 90% of it. And then if you're running a business, your other 10% deciding which new place will be your portal of access into China, which may be Singapore or somewhere else. And so it's a decision that sounds big, but is not as practically disruptive to the business. When you're talking about semiconductors, you look at the world's comprehensive and significantly expanding appetite for computing power. The level of catastrophe, the, the analogies that we've used in some of our research is probably as bad or worse than World War II. Just to give you a quick takeaway and put some dollar figures, if you look at the magnificent seven stocks trading in the US, you look at Alphabet, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, NVIDIA, and Tesla, 
right there you're talking somewhere around 15 billion 15 trillion dollars rather of market cap if there were a major chinese move against taiwan you could easily foresee a scenario where you have a 20 or 25 percent loss almost overnight just in those names alone that's the financial impact the impacts that would happen from semiconductor starvation over time would compound through the global economy and would likely be significantly larger than that but not enough to impact beijing's decision making on taiwan I wish I could fully go inside of their head and know the answer to that. But again, seeing the nature of some of the calculations we've seen to date, and again, looking at the historical patterns of how a Marxist-Leninist regime will approach these kinds of questions, if they think that they're able to preserve a relative advantage, even in a world where everybody is much worse off, that is a power gain that we have to assume in our planning that they might be willing to actually accept the trade-off for. Okay, Elsie, let's turn to the energy aspects of all of this. You've written about Taiwanese energy policy, what the elections could mean for national security on the island. There is a plan, as we understand it, to phase out nuclear energy by 2025. So what, if anything, changes with this election? So we can look at this from two perspectives. From the outside looking in, the general trajectory of phasing out nuclear by 2025 is still there because Lai, aligning with his party, DPP, they are anti-nuclear from the, since the early 90s. So to be part of his party, his main focus is still phasing out nuclear. From the second perspective, looking from the inside, like on the micro level, he might have some reevaluation or minor adjustments of the phasing out timeline. So since the current president Tsai Ing-wen took office, they've already phased out two plants out of the three that were running. And the last one standing is going to be phased out this year, one unit this year and one unit next year. And they are all reach their 40 year life expectancy. So he has hinted before that he's open to reconsider restarting old plans or extending the life of the current plans if the safety concerns were addressed. But we'll see what happens. So Taiwan would not be the only country to eliminate nuclear capability, nuclear power capability, because of political ideological commitments. The Greens in Germany are certainly a leading example of that. But is there a domestic debate now from a security standpoint on the wisdom of taking this step, given Beijing and Beijing's threatening or pressurizing tactics? I mean, it's not so much from outside pressure from Beijing. It's more about domestic safety concerns. Things, so let me give a little historic context. The first unit of the nuclear power plant was built to improve energy security back in starting 1971, just two years before the oil embargo. And then after that, after oil embargo, or the government at the time recognized the importance of energy security. They already had the plan to build four nuclear power plants total. And then by 1985, three plants that were fully running or already running and producing about 50% of Taiwan's electricity needs. And as time went on, they gradually built more coal to meet the growing energy demand. And then before the phasing out nuclear agenda emerged, nuclear was producing about 16% of electricity total. But around Chernobyl accident and in the Fukushima accident, there were lots of anti-nuclear voices around. And then there were multiple referendums cast, mixed results. So it was within the people for their life and then the safety concerns that impacted the eventual fate of nuclear power. Not so much from Beijing. Okay, they're vulnerable then to cut off in external imported energy sources. What can they do domestically to offset this vulnerability? I think the vulnerability is exacerbated by the nuclear phase out. Because Taiwan is an island, we import about 97% of the energy needs, and most of which were fossil fuels. 
we import a lot of coal, a lot of natural gas in the form of liquefied natural gas or LNG. Even though through diverse sources from Qatar, from Australia, from Indonesia, we're still heavily impacted by any kind of global market fluctuations or geopolitical tensions. The Russian-Ukraine war in 2022 impacted Taiwan as well. Even though Taiwan, because Taiwan is really limited in scale compared to the rest of the world, Taiwan maintained a state-owned electricity company and oil company that they set the electricity tariff and the gasoline or the fuel prices. They partially absorbed the impact by the war, but it still ultimately impacted end customers. So Taiwan's energy sector is very much vulnerable and facing our nuclear just exacerbated issue. And would make a blockade, if it could be enforced, a standoff blockade, an effective tool, if it could be enforced and not challenged. Potentially, and what one of the more disturbing possibilities is if you think of something that is more intense than the missile firings that we saw in August 2022 after then Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan, but maybe something that still falls a little bit short of a fully declared blockade because the minute munitions start flying, shippers respond in a way that's decisive to avoid that area. What's going on in the Red Sea right now and has been going on for months is a great example of that where you'll still get some number of vessels that might be willing to try to run that gauntlet, but the costs are higher. You don't get the volumes you need. And one of the things it does as you're injecting this risk into the system is you're progressively squeezing Taiwan's economy. Even if you don't immediately cut everything off, there's a choice that will be faced very rapidly. You're talking an island. My working estimates are for a lot of fuels. You're probably looking at 10 to 14 days of inventories, especially if you're looking at natural gas, maybe 30 days if you're looking at oil products like gasoline and diesel and jet fuel. And this is assuming that you're able to bring in the amounts that you are used to bringing in. If you have a situation where that volume is crimped, you then have to either rapidly start rationing demand, which means adverse impacts on your economy, or you continue the level of activity you had before, but drawing your inventories down and making yourself even more vulnerable to follow on action. So Elsie, what does this mean for climate goals? So Taiwan has set really ambitious climate targets to reach net zero by 2050 and reach 20% of electricity generation from renewables by 2026. I think it used to be 2025, but they changed the year. And last year, they produced about 9.5% from renewables, and then 7% is wind and solar. Last year, nuclear produced about 6% total, from the last and only power plant that was running. To face on nuclear completely and then to meet their climate goals means they need to double or even triple their wind and solar capacity and generation in the next two or three years. Possible? It's ambitious, but not entirely impossible because they had doubled that in the past two years. But speaking of energy security and reliability, While building and expanding renewable capacity, you need the dispatchable capacity for backup in the case when sun doesn't shine or wind doesn't blow. What is that dispatchable capacity? It means the power plants that can be started on a quick notice. We're talking about nuclear, that's no longer an option. We're talking about coal, and we're talking about more natural gas. So to meet their climate goals means they need to increase their fossil fuel imports that will expose them to even higher potential disruptions. Steve, is there any potential diminution in the intensity of the anti-nuclear positions of the DPP as a result of the electoral outcome? Doesn't seem to be. It's kind of the party hardcore. The identity of the DPP very firmly began thinking of as, as like a green it's party. It's the Greens. Yeah, they're just green, yeah. Okay, it's tough. Very tough. It's very tough. So how does Beijing use this apart from blockade as a pressure point, Gabe? I think the blockade angle, at least if we're talking about energy, is probably the biggest. I do think 
you have to consider, and this is to Elsie's point, if you're thinking about a scenario where you're aggressively expanding wind and solar generation capacity and you need battery storage to go with it, well, guess who's at the center of all these global green energy supply chains are enterprises based in the People's Republic of China. Now, how the PRC government would respond if we suddenly see an even larger increase in orders for these goods from entities on Taiwan is really an open question. And in some ways, how they respond, like I think what it might communicate, and you know, I'll preface this by saying we don't want to necessarily overread into the signals that we might see, but if such imports or from the Chinese perspective, exports are allowed to happen, it might suggest that they see energy as a possible pressure lever, but not the decisive one. If, however, you had a scenario where you went from, say, one gigawatt a year of wind and solar orders to two gigawatts or three gigawatts or four by Taiwanese entities, and you saw attempts by Beijing to throttle those supplies, that might actually communicate to us that energy is indeed viewed as an even stronger pressure vector, pressure lever than we had thought. A question to all three of you. Let's switch back from Taiwan to the mainland. How resonant an issue is Taiwan for the Chinese people as opposed to the party? Steve? Sure. There's actually some interesting like polling that's gone on in recent years. And of course, polling that is unfavorable to what the central government in China argues is done, but not released. The results aren't released. But that said, there has been kind of a transformation where most people in China do see this as a critically important issue. Part of this is mainly because mainland China, Xi Jinping and the leadership used to focus on Hong Kong and all of these other issues. Hong Kong is a resounding failure. It's something the Chinese people themselves don't see as a success. They themselves also saw protests because of COVID as also a sign of failure. And so this does kind of hold out the lure that Taiwan could be his last chance to prove that he's a legitimate ruler of China. So the experience of Hong Kong and COVID don't color negatively Taiwan. It's sort of the last gasp of some nationalist sentiment. And for Taiwanese, I'll flip the question. How significant anymore is the mainland as a source of identity? You said younger generations see themselves in hierarchy of identity as Taiwanese rather than Chinese in a sense that suggests the mainland as validating. Is that going to continue over time? I think so. I agree. Just as Stephen said, because of the flip in 30 years, like for my father's generation, they still see themselves as Taiwanese or Chinese. And even today, even more Chinese than before because of all the culture we shared. And then for that generation, they also disagree a lot of the point from the DPP. So even they, the DPP kind of pushed them away, pushed them towards the Chinese side, the mindset pushed them towards the Chinese side. And because of this split, the younger generation sees themselves even more as Taiwanese. The trend is going to continue to amplify. And also I think a lot of uh, one major factor that contributed to this result is because Stephen mentioned earlier too that our younger generation, we did not experience the martial law, curfews, all the protests and violence that were part of the Chinese shadow. So that's what happens today. And I think, I believe it will continue. Gabe, last word. Yes, sir. So coming from a more of an economics perspective, if we look at the last 30 years, you know, really dating from the, the Taiwan cri crisis in 1996, for the vast majority of that period, you had this phenomenal economic growth that fostered the creation of this military capability tiger I referenced earlier. But most of the narrative within Chinese society, and I think frankly that the party was trying to promote, is look at our growth now. We are great today. We will be even better tomorrow and we will overwhelm all of our adversaries. Over the last few years, and this was, these forces were in place before the pandemic, but it really accelerated it, where you see economic growth starting to be less and less a source of claimed legitimacy and securitization 
becoming a bigger source of legitimacy and coupling this with a much more isolationist approach to the world and the impacts that has when it reverberates back into internal Chinese discourse and society sets up some frankly disturbing possibilities with respect to Taiwan. Further discussion as events move on. Thank you all for your insights. Baker Briefing is brought to you by the Baker Institute for Public Policy, which provides meaningful nonpartisan policy analysis on the most critical challenges facing Texas, the U.S., and the world. Baker Briefing is produced by Victoria Jupp, Shannon Moriarty, and Karina Zamel. AV Production is led by Kevin Young. Our interns are Rice University students Riley Barker, Guy Bobien, and Maria Marcus. Be sure to visit us at bakerinstitute.org to learn more. Thank you for listening.